Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Dental Practice Launch Podcast. Today, I've got my friend Robin Morrison on here. Robin and I have worked together uh, for about a year now. Uh, we met at a uh, event in the Caribbean, which, you know, if you're going to you know, go to a dental conference, you might as well go to a dental conference in the Caribbean. So I knew I liked her right off the bat because uh, she's not in the same way that I did. But um, Robin's joining us, and Robin has a ton of experience in helping you know, dental startups, acquisitions, really helping these practices get off the ground, get them running and, and be successful as they grow and scale. And so in this series, as we're talking about acquiring or purchasing a practice, I thought it was perfect to bring Robin on. So Robin, thank you so much for joining me here today. Oh, thank you for having me, Shane. It's a joy to be on this. Well, you know, you know me and in our company, Crimson Media, we, we work with a lot of startups, a lot of acquisitions, and you know there are so many different forums and groups and things that we see different questions that get asked. You know, Should I be in network with these insurances or what should I be doing from this marketing side of things? There's, there's a number of different things that you we hear in these forums and the groups, but with you and over the years, you've I'm sure seen so many different successful practices, you know, starting from the very beginning. You've probably seen other practices um, or witnessed other practices that didn't have that same kind of trajectory to take off. I'm curious, what are some of the, the things that you've noticed that's really separated some of those successful practices versus some of those that maybe struggle at the beginning? I would say the most successful ones are very organized, well planned out, thought out, and they they really have a vision as well as their of what their philosophy is. They're able to express it. They they plan, and sometimes it's like a year, year and a half out. So it just depends, you know, on on how complicated it's going to be if they're going to do a ground up build or they're going to acquire a location. But they really do their homework. They look at the demographics. They know their target audience, or at least they spend some time discovering who their target audience might be. And um, they they um, have a strategic plan. And usually they have, a, a, I would say, a team of people around them helping them put that strategy together because it's a bit overwhelming when you think about it. I mean, opening a business is, is a lot of work, but opening a dental practice is a lot more work. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts with it, a lot of things that they have to consider. Um, so it's 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 quite an undertaking. So I would say the ones that are most successful, they know that going in and they gather the best team around them to help them be successful. And they really let that team guide them. They pay attention to the coaching and all the advice that comes from the CPAs and comes from everybody they've surrounded themselves with. Yeah. Um, what I have say, you seen for timelines as far as opening? Like, are there specific yeah. timelines where you're like, this is when you should really start thinking about some of these, you know, items on your to-do list? Sure, sure. So let's say a typical one might be a year out. They're not, maybe not doing a ground up build. They're leasing, they're acquiring a practice, something along those lines. I would say a year is good. And you start doing a lot of the little details on the front end because everybody thinks I've got time, I've got time, I can I can deal with these little things as I get closer. But the truth of it is, get those things knocked out of the way early on. And then you can focus on the big stuff like recruiting your team, your marketing strategy, um, the software you're going to need, the systems you're going to need, and all those things that take a lot of time. You know, of course, all your equipment and, you know, all, all the long list of things, you know, technology wise and that kind of thing. So I would say probably if you're starting a year out uh, and you and I've talked about this, Shane, you know, the marketing, I say at least six, seven months out, you start working on that because we both know it takes longer than we think it's going to take. And especially to get it really narrowed down to how you want it. Because sometimes we start out with a vision of how it's going to be. And then we're like, no, I think I want to go this direction or, this demographic, I think, is actually going to be better or this location. So, so many things come into play. Um, and then I would say, so you go through your marketing, um, of course, all your build out and everything's happening during that time. But then about three months before opening, you really want to start recruiting your team because 
I think we've all learned through COVID, this has taken a lot longer. It's a much longer process to recruit, hire, train the right team. And as you know, we're going through this right now with a mutual client. And we sat down this morning working on, you know, planning out our next meetings and what each meeting was going to include and the training and, you know, not just the technology and everything, but the the training of the team and helping them understand the philosophy of the practice. So it's, um, it's I think if you can get your team hired and have them start a couple months ahead or at least part time, that that's a good plan too. Yeah. And I know like when looking at the timeline of a startup, you know, one of the things you, that you're first looking at, and and I know that you help your clients with this um, through some of our mutual clients is location. Robin, how important is location to a startup practice? And are there particular things that you're looking for to advise clients on whether or not this location is you know, good versus maybe, you know, we should keep looking at other options. Yes, yes, yes. And and as you know, I'm going through that with another client right now out in Texas. And we've looked, we've been all over the map looking at locations and properties and that sort of thing. And it really comes down to narrowing down your demographics and, and doing a study on where those people are. If it's going to be, you know, families, if it's going to be an older population, if it's going to be children. So we want to look at all that. One thing that's really important to me is signage and visibility, because I feel like if you can have good signage, you're in good location, people drive by, they see your sign, they learn about you that way. I think that's a huge win. I do have some clients that are in, I, I say they're like hidden in like medical buildings and like you don't get any drive by, walk by traffic that way. And actually, we're working on one of my clients in Ohio, getting him more visibility right now because that's the situation. And he's been there a long time, doing great. But we we know we can get a lot more if we have good visibility and good signage. So I feel like that's another really important thing, too. And also, you know, if you're a general dentist yeah, so or a specialist, being around other dental practices, too, that might have you referring mutual patients back and forth, it may very convenient to refer to you if you're right by some specialty practices or if you're a specialist by some general practices too. Yeah, my favorite, some of my favorite practices that come to us are pediatric uh, startups. And they're like, yeah, I have a general dentist right next door to me or in the same you know building. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is perfect. You know, let's, let's start building that relationship now. And so that's so true. And, and when you talk about like the medical buildings, we have a client in, um, out West and they're in a medical building type situation. And I'm not kidding. There are I think 13 or 14 dentists in the same building. So it, it's not to say that you can't stand out and be successful, but it does require a lot more marketing, you know, advertising dollars because you don't have that drive by. So that's the first thing right there. If you can have uh, a signage where patients who are walking by or driving by can see it. I think that is uh, a, a cheat code in and of itself. What else? I know you talked about demographics, and this is something I think we should dive into a bit more. You know, if you're a certain type of practice, let's say you're like a, cos a cosmetic dentist, you do general dentistry, but you really enjoy cosmetic dentistry and and smile makeovers and these type of things. You know, what are some of the differences as far as demographics where you should be looking versus the bread and butter dentist who just wants to kind of drill and fill and, you know, be more of a traditional general dentist? Right. And, you know, that can be interesting, actually, because a lot of people think if you want to do a lot of cosmetic dentistry, you need to be where there's younger people. I say like the 40, age 40, 45, and that sort of thing. But I can share with you an experience from I was in a practice for 16 years. And we did a lot of cosmetic, restorative, very big cases. And um, they weren't all that young. I mean, some of them were, but we targeted specifically. Well, this I'll back up a little bit. It's an interesting story. And I think it's good for people to hear this. So this is back in the 80s. So I'm really dating myself. OK, but, <laughs> so we sat down. Nobody was marketing in the 80s in dentistry, right? Nobody was. I can tell you that. It was like I mean, taboo in the 80s to market a dental oh, yeah, practice. Definitely. There might have been two people. One was like out west and one up north, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, our practice was really the first pioneering practice in marketing and dentistry. And we hired a copywriter. And this is 1985. 
we paid him $40,000 to help us write copy. And of course, there's no internet, right? Um, so we were doing direct mail, we were doing yellow pages, we were doing like newsletters internally, of course they're printed and mail, no emailing or anything. So anyway, he came in and he sat down with us and he was a marketing specialist and he asked us, he's like, just tell me who your ideal patients are. And so we said, well, and he said, and tell me your favorite procedures and most profitable procedures. So we said, well, our favorite patients tend to be the older people, 55 and up, which I can say that now because I'm 55 and up and I can't believe it. But <laughs> I'm not going to say how up. <laughs> but anyway, so we targeted those people. <laughs> Two things. They kept their appointments and came on time and they had the disposable income at that point in their life. And so we targeted them and our favorite procedures were to do veneers, you know, um, crown and bridge, big restorative cases, even complicated with periodontal surgery involved where we worked with our specialists. So we shared all that. And they were, of course, the profitable procedures, right? So we shared all that with our copywriter and developed this campaign. And it was hugely successful. But see, we did those things you and I just talked about. We figured out our demographics. We figured out where we were going to target them. And then we also came up with a plan, of course, how we were going to handle once we had the influx of all these patients. And that did happen. We had like 80 new patients a month working three and a half days a week. And it was unbelievable, but we really honed in on the target audience. And um, of course, you know, the second part of that is, you know, converting them as callers, getting them in as new patients and wowing them and, you know, great case presentation and of course, great dentistry. So that's kind of a, I think that's a great story about really figuring out who your audience is and a really important one. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to start marketing without that. Yeah. I was going to say how many, I wonder how many practices actually sit down as a team and determine who is their ideal patient, because we go through that exercise with all of our offices, but there's been countless times where we've done this and you know, the dentist is like, oh, wow, we've never done this before, you know, and then they get together with the team and they try to figure it out. And, and it's hard, like you said, to write messaging that's going to resonate with your patient base if you don't know who you're speaking to, because talking to a, you know, 32 year old versus a 60 year old, you know, you have to, well, there may be some similarities there. If you're targeting a specific service to that specific age group, you're going to present it a different way. It's just like the commercials that you see during day, daytime TV are typically catered to older people who are retired because they may be watching TV at that time versus in the evenings, it's more of a younger audience. So I don't know when you come in and work with practices, have you found that as like a common theme where maybe they, they never really did that or, or maybe they didn't dive deep enough into it? Yeah, a lot of them have not done it. They've just kind of been able to wing it and they've done okay. These are existing practices. Now, when I go back to my startup practices, that's one thing we start on, I mean, way before they ever open and before they start marketing is their vision, what they love about dentistry, what they love doing, you know, their their whole approach to dentistry so that we have a good understanding because that's how we then figure out who their audience is. And then we figure out how the messaging is going to be and how we're going to reach them and bring them into the practice. So, um, but yeah, so, but I would say very few practices sit down as a team and kind of really figure that out and go through those easy questions. Who do you love working with as patients? What procedures do you love doing and what's most profitable? And maybe most profitable isn't always so important to a lot of practices, but I can tell you, of course, you know, it's a business. They want to be profitable. So, and, and, you know, when I'm coaching a team, it's not all about the money. It's about, it's about joy for them. When they come in their daily, you know, daily in their practice, having joy, loving the team they work with, you know, loving the patients they work on and not going, Oh, Mrs. Jones is here today. Oh my gosh. You know, of course, you're always going to have a few of those, but I mean, ideally you want to design your practice and your team, your patients, and, you know, you have kind of your agenda of what you, of, of how, what you want it to be. And that's one thing I tell a lot of startups. I'm like, this is your chance, man, make it what you want it to be. Don't start down a road and then want to turn around 
So take this time, this time you have now and let's yeah. do it right. That's a hard thing when like some startups we've worked with in the past, they've been like, Hey, I'm going to start out, you know, this is my go goal for the practice. And they want to be kind of like a more boutique higher end type, you know, feel to their practice. But they're like, but to start, I'm going to be a network of Medicaid because, you know, I just want to make sure I get patients in the door. And I tell them it's, you know, it's tough to, once you go in that direction to then mm. pivot to what your ideal, uh, you know, practice is. It's a, it's a tough transition because before you know it, so true. You know, your Medicaid patient base could be making up 60, 70, 80% of your patient base. And it, it gets much harder at, at that point. So I think that's great advice. One of the things that you talked about was, you know, training the team. And this is one of like the three key pillars that we say when you're starting a practice and building a practice, you know, there's three pillars that you really need to, to be focusing on. The right team is something that I know you have a lot of experience with in helping your clients. Can you talk a little bit about from a startup side of things, where do you start when looking for front desk for an assistant? You know, usually I know those are kind of the two that, that start in the practice as it grows. Where have you found it to be most helpful in finding these applicants and, and what's been the process and in, in kind of weeding out the, the good ones from maybe the not so great. Right. Yeah. I would say team is always the most challenging thing, starting a practice, living through a practice day to day. So team is always the most difficult thing for a practice owner. Um, so and it's interesting because different areas of the country, different things seem to work like different companies, hiring companies like I love Dental Post. They work great in some states and I don't do so well in other states with them. Indeed works great in some states, not so great in other states. Um, so, I mean, if they don't have somebody already, you know, a lot of times they come to me and they've worked with other team members, their associates, maybe in a practice, and they might have somebody, at least one team member that, you know, wants to follow them. Um, but if not, we have to start from scratch and, um, you're getting ready to work with one of my clients in Baltimore. And that's one that we did a total scratch practice in 2018 and had to hire, you know, we had no, we had nobody. <laughs> had to run ads and hire and we still have a couple of the original people as she's grown um and it's it's been really good but it it does take time i mean vetting them and you know i'm going to go into the whole thing about background checks too i would never let anybody hire anybody without doing a full background check that means talking to references criminal background checks all of that stuff because that's just so critical and i can tell you today my doctors are so nervous about doing that kind of thing. They're so worried about recruiting people and people not staying with them and that sort of thing because it's so hard to find people. So you don't want to take a shortcut just because you're feeling a little desperate. And it's like, I just, I got to get somebody hired. So like I told you that, that we start that like three, maybe two to three months in advance. It's hard to go too close to opening because people that are looking for a job are looking for it pretty soon. So, yeah, so that's one thing I do for my clients, though. I do run the ads. I do vet them. I do the interviews, um, Zoom interviews. And then once I feel like I have candidates, then I set up personal interviews for the clients to interview them. But then once you get solid people and, you know, you got to pay them. You got to pay these people fairly to get really good people because that old saying, you get what you pay for. And it's really true. So, um, but then once we get them and get them in place, then, then we start the training process. So once you hire them, you want to train them. And then just like Linda Miles says, it's hire, train, and trust. So, and that leads me into the piece about leadership. It's so critical that dentists work on their leadership skills if they're not already strong there. And I think it's something you can always work on because that helps you create your culture within your practice. And that helps retain good people. Without that, those really high level people will be looking for another place to go where they feel like they're going to have that kind of leadership. Yeah, it's like a common saying is we're not in the uh, teeth business, we're in the people business. And a lot of people think of that as um, you know, patience, which it is. But it's very much so your team too. You have, you know, you're in the people business, and as far as managing your team, 
leading your team. And just like your clinical skills, you always need to be you know, sharpening your sword, so to speak, when it comes to your, your leadership. So eventually, you know, you can trust that team and know that, hey, if you want to you know, go somewhere, take a week off, whatever the case is, um, you know, the team will still keep the, the place running and, and have it operational. So, and, and thriving. Um, one thing that I uh, have battled with before and, and heard this a lot is higher on attitude, not necessarily experience. And so with dentistry and a front desk or an assistant, what's your philosophy on that? Is it all about attitude and, and is there okay to do with no experience or little experience or is it not really that clear cut? I don't think it's clear cut, um, especially a startup practice. You've got to have some strong players. I think if you're adding people to your team and you have the luxury to train, I love hiring by attitude. I, I mean, I met, <laughs> I met a young lady like a Panera and I'm like, when I have an opening for my client in Tampa, I'm calling you because you will be phenomenal there because it's like you, you walk in and she's like, Hey, Robin, how are you today? You're going to have the same thing or, Hey, what are you doing? Or I like your hair. I mean, just everything just so ingenuine, you know, is that attitude and that personality and that relationship building kind of person, which you want, but kind of back to your question for a startup, um, I think you just have to have people, you've got to have people experienced. Um, but I do agree that as you add to your team and you've got the time to train because it's unfair not to have the time to train them, then I think that's a great thing. Yeah. And that leads right into that kind of second pillar of, you know, what's you really need to have in place. And that's systems and building the right systems as you go. And oftentimes, you know, something is built kind of on the fly with the, with the startup and that's understandable, but what are some of the basic systems that you think a brand new practice should have, you know, down fairly soon in order to make sure that that office is going to be set up properly to, to grow? Well, there's so many systems that they need, but I can tell you some of the most important ones are going to be patient retention. So that, you know, because I'm sure you see the same thing I see so many times they're, they're so focused on bringing in those new patients, but they're coming in the front and going out the back if they don't have good patient retention systems in place. So that's critical. I mean, you've got to have that out of the gate. Absolutely. Um, I think the whole new patient process is an extremely important system um, to have in place. And so that everybody's doing that consistently, everybody, same time, same thing, every patient. Um, and then I, then of course I'm so big on case presentation and, and, uh, following up on cases presented that aren't scheduled. And that's the other thing we can walk into an existing practice that maybe has only been existing <laughs> four years or something and find a million dollars worth of dentistry just sitting there. And when I ask them, what's your system for following up on unscheduled treatment? They're like, well, we kind of rely on our software and we can kind of pull a report and kind of look at it. And like, you know, it's like, that's not a system, you know, a system is, you know, what are we going to do when this happens? And then when this happens and this happens and what's the process at week one, we're going to do this at week, you know, four, we're going to do this. Or, or, are we going to text them? Are we going to call them? Or how are you going to set up that future call for unscheduled treatment? So without, without that system, that's, you know, that's, you're, you're just leaving all that treatment on the table, not to mention the patients aren't getting the care that they need and they rely on us for that. So I would say those to me are the three most important systems. I mean, of course, you've got to have great systems for following all your insurance processes and follow up on all that, um, you know, multiple things such as that. But I would say if I had to pick the top three systems, that would be it for me. We could go on and on though. For somebody who hasn't had to document, you know, systems and SOPs and all of these different things, um, do you recommend documenting them like in a, like a Google Doc? Do you do kind of like video recordings? I've heard a bunch of different ways of how people actually document kind of their processes and systems. Curious what you've seen be, you know, or work with your clients. Um, I believe in having a, a, an electronic manual that they have 
and that anybody can go to at any point. And so if they need to, especially this is really important when onboarding new employees too, so that they, they can really understand what those systems are and use it as a training manual as well. So everything from, you know, the minute the phone rings to, you know, the patient walks out the door um, so that they can, they can have that as a resource for onboarding and also as a reference too, because I always tell clients if the, if the employees, your team don't know the expectations, that's not fair. You're kind of setting them up for failure. If they don't know the expectations. When you go to them and go, why isn't so-and-so getting back in for treatment? Or why, why, why did we lose 75 patients in the last three months? If you haven't put a system in place for them and set that expectation, it's a little unfair. Um, so I feel like a manual and a lot of times it's a, it's a live manual, you know, so you don't really want to do a printed one, but if you can have an electronic one. Um, and there's some companies that make it easy for you to do that too, but in, because it's going to change as you grow, especially from a startup, it's going to change. It's going to evolve. You're going to add some technology, you know, you might change like, you know, your whole communication system for like, you know, communicating with patients, whatever it is. So you want to make sure that it's updated and everybody's on the same page. And so that's the other thing as a startup going through that is getting team trained prior to opening on what those expectations are. There's a really cool tool that we use in our company. And I don't know if this would work in a dental office or not, but for a marketing company, it works really well. It's a Google Chrome plugin. It's called Tango. And what it does is when you like click on the little plugin and it activates, it basically records every action you take on your screen. So let's say if it was like, here's the mm. you know follow-up message that you would send to a patient, it would, every time you like open up a new tab or click on, you know, this button or this button, or, it makes an individual page with a screenshot of what it did for each option. And then you can export that is a PDF. So a lot of our standard operating procedures within our company, you know, we just do the task, it records it on the screen, turns it into a PDF document, and then that's our SOP that's then uploaded into our manual, into our database. I don't know if that would work um, with some of the digital things that dentists do or not, but that's a cool tool for anybody listening to this to go check out. It's called Tango. It's free and it's a Google Chrome plugin and it saved us hours of time. Oh, I like that idea a lot. And, you know, honestly, I would say probably 65 to 70% of the practices don't have SOPs. So if anybody is listening, I mean, that would probably be a great option to get them started. It's overwhelming when you start creating one. I did one for a client and I think it was 250 pages. And that's like getting down to nitty gritty, like screenshots of tray setups and you know, all kinds of things like that. Of course, all the job descriptions and all the clinical stuff and HR stuff and, you know, all consent forms, everything built into it. So this it's overwhelming. And I think that's one reason so many practices don't do it. Or they don't do it. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, it takes a special kind of person to handle that because, you know, depending on what that person's, um, I guess, the type of personality they have, especially the dentist or the owner, they may be somewhat entrepreneurial if they're starting their own practice. And the entrepreneurial type uh, person has a hard time sitting down and doing like tedious things like that, like documenting. They, they want to do you know something that's more fun or stimulating to their brain. And I'm that way too. It's like I have you know, an operations uh, person in place on my team who they love doing the stuff that I hate and I love doing the stuff that they hate. So it's like a perfect yin yang. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's probably something in and of itself is the dentist is like, or the you know, office manager, whoever it may be just like, Oh man, you know, this seems like a lot of work, a lot of tedious work. I could be doing this, but if you do that and get that in place, as I'm sure you've seen Robin, it's like, that's going to make you, you know, more money in the long run. It's going to help you grow the practice in the long run because you have a standard way of operating. It does, it makes everything easier. Like I said, onboarding new employees and different things like that. It's just, it's, you, you do it once. And I don't wanna say you do it once and it's set, but you do the big work once. And then you add in as you have to, as things come up and you add things. 
w one question I'll ask, we won't spend a ton of time on this. We're actually going to be doing another episode on this in the, in the future with somebody. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the dirty word insurance. Um, and let's talk about that a little bit and what startups should do when it comes to, you know, being a network, uh, should they be a network with Medicaid or PPOs, or HMOs, whatever the case may be, when you're meeting with a client, um, what is that, you know, discovery process like when you're trying to determine whether or not this office should probably be a network with PPOs versus maybe all fee for service or, you know, what are some of the things that, that you look at and, and maybe what are some basic recommendations that you have there at the beginning? Um, so I would say it depends on the practice, the location, their vision, their goals, and that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm i spending most of my time these days getting people out, clients out of network. So, and so I'm trying to keep it to a minimum for my startups and putting them under maybe a couple of umbrellas. So they only have like maybe two fee schedules and they're only picking the ones they're most comfortable with, they're only choosing the ones they're most comfortable with, with the highest reimbursement rates. Um, I work with um, Dana Moss from PPO Dental Consulting, and she will do an analysis. That's who we're planning on interviewing. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Well, so she can go a lot deeper than me. She's my girl. Yep. But um, <laughs> but um, she um, but she's <laughs> such a great resource for me, and so she'll work hand in hand with my clients and help them determine. And we'll be like, well, you know, we only want to go this low on reimbursements. And then she'll do an analysis of our areas and then she'll say, okay, let's go with this. And then she, she, of course, I have her do all my negotiations and setting up and credentialing and all that fun stuff too. So, but yeah, so I, I try to keep it to a minimum. I really do. Yeah. But yeah. Dana, I Dana think will dig you know, in deep like with like you on that. A little bit earlier. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, I can't wait to to talk with Dana. She works with a lot. Of, Dana works with a lot of our offices. I'm really excited to to talk with her. And and I was going to say that it kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier, where it's it's harder if you find get yourself real deep in a lot of PPOs and Medicaid and all these things. If your plan is to eventually go out and network and be fee for service. Now, if your plan is just to be a you know PPO driven practice, that's totally fine. There's a model for that. But, you know, if the goal is to eventually be on a network and then you start taking every insurance under you know, the sun, it, it could be more challenging for you uh, in the future. Uh, that leads to the final point here. So we've talked about having the right team. We've talked about developing the systems. Marketing. This is you know our favorite thing. And I know one of your favorite things, Robin. But marketing your startup uh, before you open is so critical. I am in a lot of you know, Facebook groups where I hear different people talking about, hey, I opened up next month. What are some things I should be doing for marketing? And I'm thinking, oh, shoot, you should have started marketing uh, quite a while ago. So this is, you know, you got a lot of catching up to do. So for you and your experience, Robin, what have you, what have you seen as far as the timeline when it comes to marketing your practice and building your website and start to ground market or whatever the case is, how far out before opening have, have you found where clients should maybe start doing that or, or dentists should do that? I think like six to seven months in advance, I think start, you know, because at that point that's when they start thinking about their vision and, and their demographics and all of that. So I think to start working on, you know, that sort of thing kind of really, I have actually a vision creation form that I have them use. And that's, that's kind of our start to marketing because without me understanding their vision, it's hard for me to help direct them and help them create their marketing strategy. So I would say six to seven months ahead, um, as you know, you know, like websites and, you know, getting getting websites established and, you know, choosing their domain names and just everything they want. You know, the colors, the look, the branding, you know, the logo design, everything. Um, sometimes that goes a lot slower than they think. So I like to start all that six to seven months ahead. And then, you know, with their branding, once it's created, then we start creating marketing pieces along with the website. So a lot of our clients were creating um, their in-house plan so that they have that to offer from right out of the gate to their patients. I love to do like nice presentation folders with like stepped inserts inside with their services, Dr. Bio, you know, things really promoting what they want to promote within their practice. 
So it takes time to really get that all designed. You know, we have my writer and graphic designer who's worked with me for like 25 years, but it takes us a while to get it nailed down just to how, how the practice wants it to, to match their branding, their vision and that sort of thing. And that's some of the stuff like you don't want to just, like you said, you don't want to wait till a month before you're going to open because you're going to be scrambling and you're not going to have it, you know, you're not going to have it ready for your rollout at that point. So I would say, I would say that and, and to also to start um, some of the community marketing ahead of time, you know, we're, we're going to be opening on this date and, you know, start getting your cards out there, your brochures out there, whatever it is that you have that you want to promote, um, get, get some of that ground marketing going. I would say at least two months ahead, have that going, but you have to have everything created ahead of time for that, as you know. So, yeah, I would say six to seven months. Do you agree? Yep. Totally. That's right on the timeline that we see. And, you know, the, I think the thing that's been really beneficial to startups we work with is when you build, like, cause when your full website is being built, you know, it's probably not going to be up four or five months before you opening. But if you can have something that's like, we call it the coming soon page where it lives where your website URL is going to live. And it's just one page that talks about you, where your practice will be, what makes you different? And then you can start creating that patient list of people who kind of say, yeah, when you open, I want to you know, have an appointment there. And, and doing these events like you're talking about, Robin, in the community and the ground marketing and community events, you can then have a place to send patients, say, hey, fill out this form here. We'll make sure to contact you and reach out to you right when we you know, start booking appointments. And that's something that it builds up over time. So then that way, when you do open, it's not like, okay, we're open. Now, where are the patients at? Like, that's the worst feeling in the world. You want to make sure that you have a, a list for your team to start contacting and calling and getting those appointments scheduled. And, and I think that's right on the money. And the other thing that I will add to that is, you know, try to make people in the area feel like they're part of this journey with you. It's the most important thing that I have seen is when you start posting content on Facebook and Instagram and running some ads about coming soon and showing the, the place under construction and then giving updates on when, you know, the walls are up and when the equipment starts coming in, it sounds silly, but people in the community will continually see that on like Facebook and on their Instagrams. If you're you know targeting them, right. And they almost feel like they're a part of the process because they've seen it from the very get go. And this is going to sound really funny, but here where I live, we were getting our first, uh, raising canes, uh, <laughs> chicken place, which I love raising canes. And I was like super stoked about it, but they did a really good job with their marketing because they had ads running six months, probably before the, the opening, I saw the first ad, like talking about coming soon. It showed like the plot of land of where it was coming. And when raising canes opened up, they had a line out the door, you know, that first day because people knew that this was was coming to this community. It was an exciting thing. Why can't it be like that with your dental practice? Yeah, there are other dentists right. in the area, but why can't yours, it's going to sound stupid, but be the raising canes of dentistry? But I have had somebody say be the Chick-fil-A of dentistry before, which is also a strong, strong chicken joint. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That's funny that you have that story because where we, our house is in North Carolina in the mountains, we had this really cool place called Pizza by the River on the NOC on the Nantahala River and the, they tore the building down and we're like, oh no. So we've been watching Facebook for as they're rebuilding it and driving by and asking everybody, do you know when they're open? Do you know when they're open? So it's kind of like the Raising Cane's one. It's like following them on Facebook too. So, but it's true. It's, and you know, if, especially, you know, somebody that's kind of been around in the community too. I mean, for people to be, they know them, they're waiting for them a lot of times too. If you have no, like, if you're known in the community and this is something that our mutual client is uh, doing right now down in Florida, but it's like, if you're known in the community, it's like, don't hide your face. Put your face out there. Let people see you and know you. You're known and loved. Like, have ads running that show your face and talk about your, your practice opening because you have that brand. Whether or not you know you have a brand, you have a brand. And that brand is already there mm -hmm. and it's established. And use that brand to your advantage. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, it's great to make some cute, you know, posts, um, and Canva and things like that, but make sure that you you can see you in it, especially if you're known. 
Right. Yeah, definitely. I know it works. It works. I love it. Yeah. So, well, we're starting to run out of time here. You, you know, I mean, Robin and I, we could sit on here for hours and, and talk and do a marathon of a podcast, I'm sure together. But before we you know, wrap up here, um, for people who are listening to this, again, we talked to a lot of people who are thinking of opening a practice, whether it's an acquisition or a startup, you know, with, with your you know, decades of experience, Robin, in dentistry, um, you know, I, I tell our listeners definitely, you know, reach out to her. Uh, she's a wealth of knowledge. I've, I've learned a ton just working with you over the last year. And I would just want to kind of narrow it down to what's a couple of things. If somebody is going out and, and going to do this thing, just to kind of summarize one or two big takeaways that you think they should, you know, take with them on that journey. I would say to really, really be clear on what they want to do, what they want to do in their practice, the type of team that they want to have, the type of patients they want to work with. And like I said a little bit earlier, this is your chance to make this what you really want to make it. So do it. There's no reason not to. There's enough patients out there for everybody. Um, there's an abundance of patients out there. So I say build what you want and, and they will come. Patients will come. I mean, you can't just like, kind of hope for it, you've got to prepare for it. You've got to do the marketing, you know, and, and be prepared that way. But I would say, you know, really make it what you want to make it and be realistic too and how long it will take, you know, to get it started because it always takes longer than you think it's going to take. And um, just also the other thing is everybody worries about the finances. So make sure that you're in a financial position that you can do it. And that you have um, kind of a little padding too. So you don't kind of come out feeling desperate and panicked in the beginning. So those are just some things that we've seen, you know, that kind of the concerns that some of the startups have. So I feel like if you can, if you can be clear on what you want, build what you want and have the, the financial um, support that you need, you're going to, you're going to be successful. You're going to do really, really well. And, and, and um don't be afraid to invest in your team. That's where a lot of people feel like money's tight. I can't afford this person, but I can tell you really good team members will make your practice and make your life easier too. I think those are the most important yep, things. That's a hundred percent true. It's, it's like a shortcut for people when you hire the right team. And we, we witnessed that with an office. They, they paid for a front desk person who, was a little bit out of their, you know, initial budget, um, but they, they paid her and because she's worth it. And she has transformed that office from, from coming in from the very beginning and, and really ran the show. And so that versus someone who maybe has done, never done the job before, but it's cheap. And you think, well, that's my, you know, cousins, brothers, you know, sister's niece, you know, is really good at talking to people. Let's hire her. It's like, maybe, but it's it's so risky with the startup. You got to have the right people. You do, you do. You have the right people. You're going to do well, and and the leadership. I, I want to say one more thing about leadership. It's something I think that most practice owners always need to work on. I think we can always get better in everything we do. I mean, I've been in this business over 40 years, and I continually learn and get stronger in different areas. And I think if as long as they can keep learning more and getting stronger and stronger with their leadership, they're going to see that success come with that too. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, Robin, as we wrap up here, um, I would love for you to kind of share what are some ways that people can get in contact with you if they are wanting to pick your brain and, and maybe get you on their team as they start this journey uh, wh where can people reach you and, and how can they find you to set up a time to chat? Sure. Well, they can call me. My office number is 727-447-4756. Or they can go to my website. It's rlmmarketing.com. And um, you can learn more about what we do. And then also there is an opportunity on the website for them to schedule a call with me. So I'd be happy to jump on a call and see how we can help. Would love to. Fantastic. Yeah, we will plug that. Uh, anybody listening to this it will be in the show notes. If you're watching it on YouTube, it'll be in the in the notes there as well. So you can access those links and, and get a hold of Robin. Because like I said, he, she mentioned it earlier too. You got to have the right team together. I'm a big sports fan. Michael Jordan, 
Hill admitted himself, he may have been the greatest basketball player of all time, but he didn't win those championships himself. He had Pippen, he had Robin, Robin, <laughs> Rodman. Uh, Batman I was there. Robin is what I started thinking there, and Batman to the Robin. <laughs> so, boy, it's Friday when we're recording this, people. So, you know, getting, getting off the rails here. But, Robin, thank you again so much for everything that you're sharing with us and our, our audience. I know that they're going to be able to take this, apply it into their practices. And thanks again for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. It was fun.